Welcome to the most popular sport in the Magic community. Fast-paced, electrifying, and always risky, Quidditch has become a true sensation across the wizarding world. The greatest players achieve fame and fortune, admired and recognized for their skill and courage. Do you think you have what it takes to win and catch the snitch, which was designed by Jose Miguel Caballero Delso, Sergio Garcia Vicente, and Gonzo Brios, and published by Night Games, who helped sponsor this video and provided our intro. Hey everyone, I'm Mike Murphy of the Brothers Murph, here with Board Game Geek. Now, I know you are eager to get to the pitch and play, but we have to know if you can even fly a broom. So first, let's teach you how to play Harry Potter Catch the Snitch. Catch the Snitch recreates a rousing Quidditch match on your table where two players will choose teams from the four Hogwarts houses and take to the skies to score goals, bash bludgers, and of course, find the golden snitch. Players will use cards to determine how many actions they take in a sequence and can augment their abilities to give them an edge. But before we get into the air, let's get our team picked out and everything ready so this is how you set up Catch the Snitch. Each player will take on the role of coach for their team and must assemble their team of players. Each team will consist of seven players from one of the four houses of Hogwarts. Once a player has picked a team, they will collect cards for the seven players on their team in their matching miniature. Some cards will have a named character from the Harry Potter series with their position listed, while others will simply reiterate their position and school house. Each team must have seven players broken down into three chasers with an orange base, two beaters with black bases, a keeper with a white base, and finally a seeker who has a purple base. You may arrange your cards how you like, but be sure to keep all cards visible as they possess valuable information. Each card will remind you of that player's position and team, as well as show the types of actions they can do and which dice must be rolled to carry out those actions. Cards may also contain important traits for the character, so be sure to familiarize yourself with each member of your team. Each player must also collect their deck of tactical cards matching their team. For your first game, it is suggested to simply use each tactical card with a galleon cost of zero. In future plays, you may use a budget of galleons from which to purchase cards in more veteran players, but we'll leave that for you to explore later. Once each player has collected their player cards and miniatures and their tactical cards, the pitch must be set up. First, place the pitch between the two coaches, with each coach choosing a half as their own to defend. Next, place your keeper with the white base into your side scoring zone and your other six players in your half's deployment zone near the center. Place your player cards in easy view beside the board. Now the snitch deck must be prepared. First, remove any snitch cards marked lagged as they will not be used until later. Then deal and shuffle 10 snitch cards and place them face down to form the deck. Take the four bottom cards from the deck and add the Golden Snitch card, shuffling it in and returning these cards to the bottom of the deck so the Golden Snitch is somewhere among the last five cards. Place the Snitch deck on the board and draw the top three cards face up for both players to view. These cards will factor into the second phase of the game and players will be attempting to earn as many Snitch cards as possible. After the Snitch deck is set up, players will shuffle their tactical cards and place them face down in front of them to form a tactical deck. Each player will draw five cards to make their starting hand. Be sure to keep these cards secret from your opponent as they will dictate your actions and allow you to play powerful effects. Once each player has set up their team and cards, it's time for kickoff. Kickoff begins by rolling a die. All dice show success symbols and opportunity symbols. Each coach chooses one of the two types of symbols and a roll takes place. Whichever symbol gets rolled, that coach will gain advantage and the quaffle is given to one of that coach's chasers with the orange bases. That coach will also collect the attack token. Note that when in possession, the Quaffle must be in contact with the player who possesses it to make it clear. That coach now controls the attacking team while the other coach controls the defending team. Beginning with the attacking team, each coach will place one Bludger miniature into their rival's half of the pitch, excluding the deployment zone or scoring zone. Next, players will break off from the deployment zone. Beginning with the attacking coach, they choose one player in the deployment zone and move them into any adjacent zone. Next, the defending player will choose two players to place in zones adjacent from their deployment zone. Then the attacking player will have a chance to move two players to adjacent zones, and finally the defending coach will move one final player to an adjacent zone from their deployment zone. During the kickoff sequence, no player may be moved more than once by any means. If the player who possesses the quaffle is moved during kickoff, be sure to move the quaffle along with that player keeping it in contact. With this, the kickoff sequence is complete and the game sequence can begin. Once players have been moved about and the game has just started, we move into the meat of the game with game sequences. Here, players will be using their tactical cards to carry out actions to move past and shoot the quaffle and send bludgers into the paths of their opponents. As goals get scored, snitch cards will be collected and once the snitch appears, the game goes into its final phase. But before we get to that, let's take a deeper look at game sequence. In the first phase of the game, play proceeds through a series of steps known as a game sequence. As mentioned before, players will be using their tactical cards to carry out actions and make use of intrepid move effects. 
First, each player will secretly choose a tactical card they wish to play and then play it face down in front of them. For this card, you will only be concerned with what is at the very top of the card, which will feature three action blocks that show a number of action icons within them. For each action block, the active player will be able to carry out as many actions as there are icons present before play transfers to the next player. If when play returns to you, you still have an action block containing action icons, you'll carry out that action block, once again carrying out an action for each icon within that block. Once each player has picked their first tactical card, they will reveal it and then each player may choose to add up to two cards used for their intrepid move effects. Note, this will not give you more action blocks. You will only be concerned with the text written lower on the card. All cards played for their intrepid move will be placed to the right of the first card you revealed. If any intrepid moves are played, they will be resolved in reverse order from right to left. The attacking coach resolves their first card, and then the defending team continues and resolves their first intrepid move, going back and forth until both players have resolved any intrepid moves they played, if any. Next, action blocks are resolved, beginning with the attacking player resolving the action icons in their first action block. The defender may then resolve their first action block. If the attacking player has any more action blocks remaining, they will activate again, and the defending coach will then do the same until each player has completed all the action blocks they have. If at any time one player has more action blocks remaining but their opponent doesn't, they may carry out all remaining actions without interruption. Each action icon allows the active coach to make use of an action with one of the members of their team. Every player has the ability to move from zone to zone and recover, and as such, those abilities will not be listed on their player card. Some players will have access to certain actions that will require dice to execute, and these will be listed on the player card, so be sure to reference this when taking actions. As an action, you may have a player move. They simply will look at a zone that is adjacent to their own and move into that space. If the player moving possesses the quaffle, be sure to move it with that player. A space is considered adjacent if it shares a white line as a border. To move, no dice roll is required. To move, a player must not be at a disadvantage. A player is considered disadvantaged if they are in a zone that contains more members of the opposing team than their team. Players at a disadvantage will suffer one fewer success from their action rolls or one fewer opportunity from their reaction rolls and will not be able to move as well. Some special rules or intrepid moves will allow a player to shift rather than move. It works in the same way as a move action, however it ignores disadvantage allowing that player to move freely. If a player possesses the quaffle, they may perform a pass to quickly shift the quaffle to a friendly teammate. The quaffle can be passed up to two zones away and the active player will target their teammate and make a dice roll using the dice indicated on their player card. The active player must roll one success denoted by the quaffle symbol on dice. If the dice roll is successful, move the quaffle to the player who is targeted by the pass. If no successes were rolled, the quaffle is placed loose and the active player loses possession and the opposing team gains the attacking team token. Remember that players at a disadvantage will suffer one fewer success on dice rolls and if a player is outnumbered by two or more opponents, they are at a severe disadvantage and suffer two fewer successes on dice rolls. The opponent may choose whether the quaffle is placed loose in the target player's zone or a zone adjacent to it. A loose quaffle may be immediately picked up by a player on their turn without requiring an action. Simply place a quaffle in contact with your chaser and proceed with your action. If you are on the defending team and you are in the same zone as a player with a quaffle, you may attempt a steal of the quaffle. You will reference your player card for the appropriate dice and then attempt the steal. The player containing the quaffle, however, may make a reaction roll using their own steal value to try to evade the would-be stealer. Here, both players will roll dice and compare. The active player will count up their successes while the player carrying out a reaction will count up the opportunities they've rolled denoted by the beater's clubs. All opportunities rolled by the reacting player will remove successes rolled by the active player. If the active player rolls more successes than their opponent does opportunities, the quaffle is successfully stolen and the quaffle is placed in the stealing player's possession. This too will cause the attacking team token to shift to the opposite team. If one of your beaters finds themselves next to a bludger, they can give it a whack and try to stun an opposing player using the beat action. First, they will target an opposing player anywhere up to two zones away, and then they will make a roll using the dice shown on their player board for the beat action. The opposing player may use Maneuver as a reaction if it is present on their card, and once again both players will roll dice and compare successes versus opportunities, and the player with the best roll wins. If the beater wins the roll, they stun the targeted player who must place a stun token on their player card. Each player may possess multiple stun tokens up to three, and they will remove one success or opportunity from dice rolls per stun token until they are removed through hand swaps or recover actions. Note that stun tokens are cumulative with this advantage as well. If the beater is unsuccessful in their roll, the targeted player is not stunned, but in both scenarios the bludger is still placed in the same zone as the targeted player. 
If an opposing beater is present in the zone of the targeted player, or they themselves are the target of a beat action, they may use the defense reaction to protect against bludgers and may use their defense value for their reaction rolls. All players may use the recover action to remove one stun token from one of the players on their team. As a reminder, this action is not listed on player cards as it's possible for every player to make use of this action and does not require a dice roll. All right, so there are bludgers flying around, stunning people, passes and steals taking place and swift moves up and down the pitch. But what if I find one of my chasers with a quaffle in the opponent's scoring area? If one of your chasers has possession of the quaffle in your opponent's scoring area, you may attempt to shoot as an action. Note that only a single chaser in the team's keeper may be in a scoring area at one time. If the opponent's keeper is not present in the scoring area, the active player simply needs to roll a success to score a goal. However, in most instances, the keeper is going to attempt to defend their hoops and a few steps must be carried out. First, both players will secretly choose one of three hoops they are aiming at using their goal hoops cards. Once each player has selected one of the three hoop cards, they reveal what they have played. If both players reveal the same number, play proceeds as normal, but if both players reveal different cards, the chaser attempting the shot will add one additional success to their action roll. Next, both players roll dice, the chaser using the dice for the shoot action on their player card, and the keeper using the dice indicated by the catch action on their player card. Players compare successes to opportunities as usual. If the shooting player is successful, they take a score token and place it next to their player cards. In addition, they must choose one of three face-up snitch cards to be used in the second phase of the game. Then a new snitch card will be drawn face up. If the golden snitch is not drawn, play proceeds as normal. If the shot is unsuccessful and the keeper is not present in the scoring area, the active player loses possession of the quaffle and it goes loose in the zone. If the keeper is present and successfully catches the quaffle, they immediately perform a keeper's kickoff. First, any opposing chaser within the keeper's scoring area must shift to an adjacent zone outside the scoring area. Then, beginning with the attacking team, which is now the new team with the quaffle, both coaches may shift one of their players to an adjacent zone, excluding scoring areas. The keeper will then perform a pass with no action being spent and the pass automatically succeeds with no roll. Once the keeper's kickoff is resolved, play continues. As players carry out actions, when they successfully pass, steal, beat, or shoot, they gain a tempo point. Anytime you gain a tempo point, place it near your player cards. Anytime you have more than three tempo points, you must discard them all to acquire a snitch card from the face-up row. After successfully completing the actions just mentioned, you can instead break tempo. If you do this, you do not gain a tempo point for successfully completing your action and instead may perform a free pass action or shift one of your players one zone. This will interrupt the game sequence and the sequence will resume after the tempo break has completed. At the end of the game sequence, each coach will be allowed to move one bludger and let chaos reign supreme. The defending coach chooses a bludger first. If there are any players in an adjacent zone to the bludger, the bludger must move there. If there are multiple eligible zones, you may choose which zone the bludger goes to. Once the bludger has moved, a player in that zone may be targeted. The player may perform a maneuver reaction to avoid the bludger. If they roll successfully, nothing happens, but if they fail to roll a success, that player gains a stun token. After the defending player has carried out bludger movement, the attacking player will move the other bludger. Note that if a bludger does not have any players in a zone adjacent to it, it cannot be moved and will remain in its zone, but counts as having been moved and may be used against an opponent. If the bludger is moved or remains in a zone with only friendly team members, any potential hits are ignored. Once both players have completed all of their actions and bludgers have moved, the used tactical cards from that sequence are discarded and another game sequence takes place. If ever at the start of a game sequence, one or both players have no cards in hand, they must perform a hand swap by drawing five cards from their tactical deck. If both players perform a hand swap, simply draw cards, but if one player performs a hand swap and the other does not, the player not performing the hand swap is given one free action immediately. Any of the aforementioned actions can be carried out and does not require an action icon from an action block, and after the action is carried out, that player collects a tempo point token. Please note, any time your opponent carries out a hand swap, you are allowed to remove a stun token from one of your player cards. Play will continue with play sequences taking place as the quaffle moves and bludgers stun. As players score goals and turn in tempo points for snitch cards, the likelihood of the snitch turning up grows ever greater. And once the snitch arrives, phase one of the game immediately ends and we move into the snitch. Once the snitch has arrived, play immediately shifts to phase two, even if this occurs in the middle of a game sequence. During the second phase of the game, team seekers make a mad dash for the snitch, hoping to claim victory for their team. Players will be using the snitch cards they collected during the first phase of the game. Each snitch card will list two effects that will be carried out when the card is played. To race for the snitch, first each player places their seeker on one end of the snitch track, which goes around the edge of the pitch. 
Then place the golden stitch miniature at the other end of the snitch track. Advance the snitch a number of spaces equal to twice the number of snitch cards left in the snitch deck row, excluding the snitch card itself. In this example, since there are four snitch cards left, the snitch will advance eight spaces. The coach with the fewest snitch cards will receive lagged cards equal to the difference of snitch cards their opponent has. This way, both players will have an equal amount of snitch cards. Now play continues with each player secretly choosing a snitch card to play and places it face down. Once both players have selected, they reveal their cards. The coach who collected the most score tokens goes first, and if there is a tie, a roll will take place with each player choosing success or opportunity, and the first player goes to the winner of the roll. In the future, the coach whose seeker is ahead on the snitch track plays their card first. If both seekers are on the same space, the player who reached the space first is considered to be in the lead. The first player resolves both effects listed on their snitch card in order. Effects will cause your seeker to move forward, push your opponents back, make use of dice rolls, and more, so be sure to use the right card for the right situation. After the first player has resolved their card, their opponent continues with their card carrying out both listed effects. Repeat these steps until one of the seekers has reached the golden snitch, claiming victory. If both players use all of their golden snitch cards but no player reaches the snitch, victory will go to the player who gets the closest to reaching the golden snitch. And that is how you play Harry Potter Catch the Snitch. This game is all about maneuvering your players into the right spots at the right times to control the tempo of the game and score as much as you can to give you an advantage as you search for the elusive snitch. This game has more to explore as you can incorporate funding into your game, giving you and your opponent a set amount of galleons to use on purchasing tactical cards and veteran players, and you can even add in optional rules for spectators which will add more depth to the game. We'll leave you to explore those on your own, but if you'd like to know more about Catch the Snitch, you can always check out its page at BoardGameGeek.com. And until next time, I'm Mike Murphy, I've been here with BoardGameGeek, and that is how you play Harry Potter Catch the Snitch. Have a great day.